Today, in Manchester Crown Court, a jury will be sent to start deliberating on the fate of Thomas Cashman. The judge will first give a summary of the evidence. The judge's summary began yesterday, so I'll begin there. The judge says, We have now reached a final stage before you retire to consider your verdicts. You probably didn't anticipate being involved in something as high profile as this. There is no getting away from the fact you have been given a heavy responsibility. Everyone here recognises you have exercised your roles as jurors diligently throughout the trial and I am sure you will continue to do so. This is a case that engenders emotion. You know you need to be analytical to focus on the evidence. I have observed you doing that throughout the trial. What is required is a calm, dispassionate review of the evidence heard in this courtroom. You should examine all the evidence and decide where that takes you. I've now heard the arguments each side make about the evidence and the conclusion you say you can safely draw. It is my role to provide a fair and balanced summary of the evidence you've heard. I am not intending to express any views on the evidence. I am simply summarising the evidence you have heard to prompt your memories. There are two people whose accounts occupied a significant part of the time during the trial. That is the defendant and the unnamed witness. The unnamed witness told you Mr Cashman appeared in her bedroom and asked for a change of clothing and said something that she recognised as a confession when she read the news the next day. Mr Cashman said he did nothing of the sort. He was at Craig Bryan's house and he has called on Nicholas McHale in support of that alibi. You will need to analyse the evidence to decide who is telling the truth. You do not assess the evidence on these witnesses in isolation. My role is only to prompt you. There may be things I mention you do not think is important or something I admit you do think is important. It is for you to decide how the evidence fits together. The assessment of the evidence is for you. I am going to begin with the background evidence. The defendant said he began smoking cannabis in his teens and progressed to selling it. He became a cannabis dealer and described himself as a high-level cannabis dealer. He was selling by the kilo, making three to five thousand pounds per week. He said he had five to six people he sold to regularly, but declined to name those people. Sometimes he would use his sister's home to meet people, but his sister's boyfriend was an ex-police officer and he didn't like it. He said he also used his mate Nicky McHale's house as a stash house. He supplied Mr McHale with drugs. He said he would supply drugs to friends who lived at his brother's Kevin Dunn's house, but his brother didn't agree with that. He dealt drugs behind his brother's back. He said he's not a bad person. He said he helped people as much as he could and he's not a bad drug dealer who sells Class A drugs. Moving on to the evidence of the mobile phones, the judge says. The judge said, You will remember the evidence of Detective Constable Craig Doyle. He said a total of six phones were attributed to him and none were in use between August the 19th and 24th last year. Mr Cashman said he never really had phones. He would have a cheap one for a bit and he would get rid of it. He would never buy a phone from a supermarket. He would use his partner's phone at the time. The judge now turns to Joseph Nee. She begins to tell the jury, you know a little about Joseph Nee. He is a man who has had previous convictions. He and his family had enemies. In March 2018, 
he was shot at by someone other than the defendant. The defendant told you Joseph Ney and his brothers were his friends. He did not have his phone number saved in his phone, but he said that applied to a lot of his friends. They would talk about cars and motorbikes. He had been at Mr Ney's mum's house with his brothers. They were surprised to see him in a van as he usually drives high performance cars. But it was his graft van. Mr Nee said the same about his van. He, meaning Cashman, said they parted company on good terms and there was no reason he would want to shoot his friend. He said he did not know the Corbell family. The judge then turned to a relationship with the witness who can't be named. They say she took exception to many of the questions which she did not think were relevant to the case. The defendant alleges she was not well disposed to him. She said Mr Cashman was a generous lad who had been good to her. They had been friends and that they had become friends with benefits. She said they had sex on three occasions, or two really at the second time, the defendant could not get an erection. She said it was more friendship than sexual. The defendant told you he got to know her through Paul Russell. He sold cannabis to Paul Russell, who sold it on. He said she was Paul's girl. He was not attracted to her at first, but things developed and he knew where it was going. The defendant said it happened on a lot more than three occasions. The last time was a time on a different shooting. He said it was a bit of fun, not love. Kaylee knew nothing of this until he was in prison, which broke her heart and his. She was not happy with Paul Russell, I wanted to leave him. She said she was infatuated with the defendant. He was a good friend and a good listener. She said it was nothing to do with sex and denied she wanted to leave his family for her. She accepted they had fallouts, but denied it was a toxic relationship. She accepted she was angry with him towards the end. She said she had found out he was having sex with his partner's best friend. She thought Kaylee had a right to know. It led to her considering setting up a fake Instagram account to make it known. The judge then moves on to the messages the witness sent to her friend, where she said she would ruin Cashman. And this is in reference to the text message that reads, It's time to ruin him like he has done me, my relationship, everything. Just as she says. You will look at the context of that and the surrounding messages. The discussion included having to get it out there about him and that slut and talk about making our black account, says the judge. The judge continues. She accepts she told her friend she couldn't stop thinking about Tommy. She accepted she was short of money. She had considered signing up to OnlyFans but didn't do it. She said she told Tommy about that and that he had told Tommy's brother. She said that led to murder for her. She felt that had ruined her relationship with Paul. The defendant said he had not realised how obsessed she was with him. He had not realised how affected she was by the relationship. He said her evidence is a total lie. He says that just shows how low a woman's scorn can go. She has tried to stitch him up for the murder of a child. The judge then reminds the jury of the, of the claims that Paul Russell owes Thomas Cashman 25000 in drug debt. And this is for five kilos of cannabis, I think it was. The judge then carries on to describe what Thomas Cashman said about taking his graph phone in the car. He said... He would have ended up getting a punch if he refused. 
The unnamed witness said she owed 2500 in rent but denied the existence of the drug debt. The judge says she denied she had been interested in an award related to this case. She said she had given her police interviews by the time the reward was put up and she knew she was never entitled to it. She said she may she said she may have been joking. She said she may have had a joking conversation about the award, but it was banter. She denied she was lying to stitch the defendant up. She said she was heartbroken he had put her in this situation and wondered why he expected her to keep quiet. She said he had ruined her whole life. She said it hurts to give evidence against him, but she had to for this little girl. She said she can't forgive anyone who has done that to her child. Nicholas McHale attended as an alibi witness for the defendant. He said he had known Mr Cashman all his life, although they hadn't been close until the last two or three years. Mr Cashman took his house on and decorated it from the top to the bottom, then allowed Mr McHale to move back in. He asked the defendant if he could begin selling cannabis. He said he was not pressured into doing it. Mr Cashman said yes and wanted to continue to store his drugs at Mr McHale's house. He has since been convicted of possession with intent to supply cannabis and received a suspended sentence, but had no previous convictions. He said he had come to the court because he knew Mr Cashman was innocent. Referring to the unnamed witness's police interview, the judge says, she said her world came crashing down. She was interviewed on suspicion of assisting an offender. She said she was petrified someone would see her in custody. She did admit she had lied to the police in her first interview because she was petrified. She said she told the police Tommy had taken his clothes to protect her partner. She said she was petrified to mention the relationship at the time. I did not want her partner to know about it. She said she was mortified to be in the situation and she and Paul were trying to protect each other but would not lie to protect Mr Cashman. She told the police Mr Cashman had left in the same clothes he came in. She said that lie was to protect her partner. Data from her Fitbit showed she had been walking around the house when she claimed to have been in bed. She admitted she had lied previously. In a fourth interview, she told the police about Mr Cashman taking clothes from her house. The police subsequently found the clothes taken that night in search of his sister's house on Mad Lane on September the 5th. The defendant accepts he got that clothing from her home, but said he did so on an earlier occasion. You, members of the jury, will have to consider the admitted lies told. Her explanations for them, the context and chronology, when you consider the account she has given to you. Turning to Thomas Cashman's interviews under arrest, the judge says, He gave a prepared statement and made no further comment to questions. When he was arrested for the second time, again, he gave no comment. He told you he received legal advice to go no comment and took that advice other than giving a prepared statement. He denied trying to fit his case to the evidence. It was his right to say nothing. However, the prosecution invite you to say the reason he remained silent was he wanted to wait to tailor his account to meet the prosecution's evidence at a later stage. The defendant accepts he didn't give his alibi he didn't give any explanation for how the clothing came to be in his sister's home and he didn't say anything about the reasons for her to lie. He simply declined to answer any questions at all. The prosecution say there were important things he did not mention and that should harm this defence. Moving on to Thomas Cashman's defence statement, the judge says 
The defendant's case is set out in his defence statement. One point put to him was after the time he was seen on the corner of Berryford Road, he took the drugs to Nicky McHale. The prosecution had produced the photo of Nicky McHale at the time in Alderley Edge. The defendant said that this was an error and his statement should have said Nicky McHale's. The judge also says there is another point in the defence statement that the prosecution have raised. They say, the defendant described meeting Craig Bryan, getting into Mr Bryan's van and going to Snowbury Road. No mention was made of going to the cemetery to drop off rubbish. The defendant's response is he didn't put every last thing into that statement, only the relevant bits. He did not think it was important to say that they stopped at the cemetery to get rid of rubbish. The judge says, the prosecution suggests that this was invented by Thomas Cashman to address a problem in the timings of the journey to Snowbury Road. The judge also says, Mr McHale was also interviewed on suspicion of assisting an offender in February this year. Mr McHale answered no comment to all questions. The judge says he accepted he was asked about Mr Cashman, where he was and who he was with on the night of the shooting. That was his right to remain silent. You are entitled to take his silence to the police into account if you judge that is a relevant consideration. Turn into the various journeys of Thomas Cashman and Joseph Nee caught on CCTV during the course of the day, the judge says. Mr Cashman denied scoping out Mr Nee. He said he was stuck in a rut and his days would all look the same. He said this day was no different from any other day. He said he was driving around collecting money and dropping off cannabis. He said it was a normal day and denied he was trying to fit the story to the evidence. The defendant said he would not drive around with large amounts of cannabis. When he was taking cannabis, he would walk. He said this is what he was doing when he came out of his sister's house and went to Nicky McHale's to take to his brother's house. He denies he was looking for Mr Nee's van or was caused to turn around because the van had gone. He said he was going there to give the lads who lived there cannabis but he saw his brother. Knowing the brother would not approve, he turned around. He pointed his brother out in the footage. It was raining torrentially and he had put on a more suitable tracksuit. He denied he was seeking to disguise himself. Having seen his brother, he went to Nicky McHale's to put the drugs away. So after this was a short break, so I'm going to leave this bit of part one and I'm going to...